life today uh ancient greece part two we're going to be discussing socrates plato and aristotle um i want to give a shout out to three new patreon members we got mick or mike z uh we've got tim kirsch and we've got minty farewell thank you guys for uh contributing you can check us out at patreon.com slash mike and maurice uh, all the links there are uh, on the screen, and they will be below the video as well. And uh, let's get into it. Mike, Tim, and Minty, thanks again. All right. So, uh, as you can see, um, we've got uh, Ancient Greece Part 2, and uh, we're going to be diving into some philosophy today. Good, good. The good stuff. All right, let's get into some terminology. So philosophy uh, literally translates to the love of wisdom. Telos is purpose, goal, or end. Uh, logos is the principle of order and knowledge or reason discourse. Uh, epistemology is the theory of knowledge. Um, ontology is the study of being. And interlocular interlocutor uh, is a person who takes play or takes part in uh, dialogues or conversation. So that would be somebody that you know is within the um, you know the uh, scope of uh, the discussion or dialogue when they're you know during Plato's dialogues or something that's taking place in, the, in that regard. Gotcha, gotcha. <clears throat> All right, let's get into Socrates here first. So. Socrates, Big boy. yeah, he was born around 470, lived to, we know, 399 B.C. based on uh, Plato's uh, dialogues. And uh, the dialogues, there's a few, we'll get into it, but there's a few dialogues that talk about his death specifically, the trial, um, and then his final hours and stuff leading up to his eventually... Ex or his eventual execution or poison. Uh, Socr Socrates was a Greek philosopher from Athens, a uh, founder of Western philosophy, and was credited uh, as being the first moral philosopher of Western ethical thought. He did not write or record any of his teachings or philosophies, but his students Plato and Xenophon did write his uh, philosophies down in his teachings. Um, as I mentioned, Plato, almost every single one of his dialogues includes Socrates, except for the last one, I believe, which is Laws. Why didn't he write them down? He didn't want people to remember <clears throat> the stuff, or he wanted you to hear it word of mouth? It just wasn't that common back then, I don't think, to write stuff down. And, and Plato is actually really the first person to start writing for real and and. I mean, his writing, some of the best writing even to this day, The Republic's probably one of the most revered pieces of writing from the ancient world, if not of all time. All right. Uh, Plato's dialogues are the most compre comprehensive accounts of Socrates' teachings and philosophies, uh, which highlight his contributions to ethics and epistemology. Uh, as we mentioned before, epistemology is the theory of knowledge. You know, how do we know what we know? Uh, Socrates used Socratic irony to confuse his adver adversaries in dialogues and debates. Um, he also used the Socratic method, which would lead adversaries and students to critically think and ultimately to conclusions that would contradict their initial position and help further their knowledge. Uh, this was described in the dialogue uh, Theotetus. So he, what he would do is he would engage a student or let's say an adversary, let's say they get into a debate, um, and the, his line of questioning would lead that person who had kind of an initial um, perception of, of what they thought about a specific subject, and then he would okay. lead them down a different path by asking them certain questions, which would ultimately push them you know, to either further their knowledge on a subject or address what they didn't know you know, or, yeah. you know, bring them to some sort of conclusion that not necessarily he wanted them to come to, but just that he felt like was, you know, some semblance of truth. Uh, he was falsely accused of corrupting the youth of Athens and was executed by way of poison, which they used hemlock to, to poison him. 
Um, Xenophon wrote that Socrates was a teleologist and suggested that God arranged everything for the best. He was considered a more, like I mentioned above, he was considered a moral and just philosopher. He proved it in the way he lived and the way he died. Um, so he was just an all around good, good dude, you know, and he just wanted people right. to learn. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't, he was accused of being a sophist, but he wasn't, he didn't take any money from anybody. Uh, he just generally wanted people to learn. Um, and we'll get into some of the reasons why they thought that. Uh, after Athens lost the Peloponnesian War to Sparta, um, Socrates got himself into trouble by basically he was critiquing the Athenian democracy uh, and calling out its powerful politicians. He also praised Sparta on certain topics in the dialogues. Uh, so Sparta, you know, they were considered the Athenians were like the intellectuals, the statesmen, the politicians, that kind of stuff. And Sparta was more of like. The warrior what, warriors exactly and, and people that would like drink and party and then also destroy people in battle uh but he's there was something about them that he admired which was just you know even though the athenians were smarter and whatever it wasn't just brute force that overtook them it was their you know the way they went about it their strategy all that kind of stuff so he, right. he admired that he was accused of corrupting the youth of Athens, like I meant, uh, mentioned. Uh, he was accused of impiety, you know, not believing in the gods. And he was also accused of being a sophist, which I mentioned before. A sophist is somebody that um, is teaching somebody something for pay or for money. You know, um, a, a sophist could be considered somebody uh, that they, they're they're they're. And what's main, wrong with that? Well, their main per back then it was, yeah. I mean, some people don't have a problem. That's basically what professors and teachers and stuff yeah. are, are now. But back then, um, it was kind of looked down upon because it's like you're trying to spread knowledge by. But it, it wasn't just teaching for pay. It was like a, a certain. They were going to give people the tools that they needed just to win dialogues and arguments and gain political power so they would teach you what you needed to know to move up in the world without necessarily you understanding it if that makes sense or you somewhat taking in the moral and ethical standpoints of it um yeah you're going somewhere it's not deserved <clears throat> exactly um and a lot of rich people would have you know their their kids taught by sophists and uh but yeah he was none of those things that he was accused of being since he did not write or record anything, most of what we know uh, of him is from Plato's dialogues. He was such a moral and ethical philosopher that he even turned down his friend Credo's offer to escape his execution. Um, so his rich friend Credo, uh, leading up to his death, offered to to finance a way for him to get out and and just get get away from everything, and he turned it down. Um, Bad some, move. Yeah, some of the Socratic paradoxes are no one deserves evil, uh, no uh, no one er errs or does wrong willingly or knowingly. Virtue, virtue, all virtue is knowledge. Virtue is sufficient for happiness. So those are some of the, as we mentioned in the previous episode, what paradoxes are through uh, Zeno's work as a pre-Socratic his quote paradox uh, meaning that you can never achieve it or no it's just this you know like we've and we've also talked about like the fermi paradox it's this thing if something is happening it's this it's basically a contradiction of itself so it's like the fermi paradox if there's gotcha, life if gotcha. there's life in the universe how come we don't you know see it where is it where's all the life if if it's everywhere we know mathematically the probability of it why doesn't it exist so like is the yeah. Zeno paradox the, a, a version of it that we mentioned before would be if somebody's walking down a path and then they walk halfway to their destination and then halfway to that destination and then halfway to that destination and it keeps going on and on does it do they ever reach their because they're constantly going halfway but it, we uh -huh. know through science yeah there is there is an end physical end point, you know, uh, -huh. uh, his quotes, I know, or I know that I know 
nothing is from the apology uh which describes you know the, the end pretty much toward you know or towards the end for him he believed moral order was very important uh, he saw Ionian physics and sophists as somewhat of a threat to moral order since they lacked telos, which is purpose. So that's what I was mentioning before. Like a sophist is somebody that just wants to get the knowledge out there, but not necessarily cares what the person that learns it does with it. Um, and Socrates thought that for, or so Ionian physics. So we discussed that in part one with the pre-Socratics. So, that was basically just an early version of science and physics. Um, it was explanations for the natural world. Um, a lot of those guys did partake in metaphysics, but it wasn't necessarily um, a belief in a higher power or a God. It, they were just trying to figure out what was going on in the universe. So without any sort of actual purpose or, or some sort of higher power, he believed that they they lacked, you know, in that regard. So, but they didn't believe in any god, correct? Uh, some some did. I mean, some of the you know we'll get into it, and even you know right. P- Plato, uh, a lot of his works been used, you know, was taken on by like Thomas Aquinas and, and led to early Christianity and and that kind of stuff, the uh, Neoplatonic stuff uh, or Neoplatonism. So. Socrates never charged money for his dialogues or teachings, and he was not a wealthy man. Um, I think there's even a point where he's on trial where they're saying, you know, just confess and whatever, and he's saying there's two options. You can either treat me as an Olympian and feed me for free, or you can kill me, basically, is is kind of what it came down to. <laughs> wow. Um he associated justice with being a social animal and accountable to others as referenced in Plato's Republic. So what he means by that is just that we live in a society and we have to adhere to these order, the the order and the rules of things and that we have a responsibility to others as where animals kind of just do what they want. They don't give a shit, you know? Right. Right. So that would be the difference that he was talking about there. Uh, he used mathematics to drive his points home in the dialogues. Pythagoras was a huge influence on Socrates and Plato. And we'll talk a little bit about that later, but Pythagoras, uh, was a huge influence on him and Socrates and Plato, when they're in an argument or they're in a dialogue or they're in a discussion, uh, when they're really trying to take the thing home or take the other person down, they go to mathematics because mathematics is this, is this empirical thing that you can't really reject. You know, like a triangle is a yeah, triangle. Yeah, it's black and white. Well, exactly. yeah, a triangle is a triangle no matter what. A square is a square no matter <clears throat> what. You know, th- there's there's really no argument or there's no subjective way to look at that kind of stuff. So, so did Socrates write a lot of his uh, his history or uh, what, how was he? How was all his accounts documented? I, as I mentioned. Uh, all through Plato. Plato was a student, so. Oh yeah, sorry, never mind. No, so, so yeah, everything. Oh, Plato Z- documented Socrates and Xenophon too, but Xenophon gotcha, not gotcha. nearly as much as Plato. Plato has a whole library of dialogues, which we will go through pretty much every one of them and discuss which each one is about. So Socrates comes first, and then everybody comes from him. Well, Socrates, well, as we discussed, the first part of this series was the pre-Socratic. So that was all the Greek philosophers, the first ones pretty much to Socrates. And then that's how they divide the areas up. Some people don't like, you know, those, that terminology, it doesn't matter, whatever. Uh But, but everybody until Socrates was considered a pre-Socratic philosopher in terms of Greek and Western philosophy. And then there's Socrates, Plato and Aristotle, which kind of changed the game they, you know, Socrates taught Plato, Plato taught Aristotle, um, and Aristotle's pretty much the blueprint for what we know as modern science and biology and that kind of stuff. So Plato speaks as Socrates in all of the di- uh, dialogues except for laws, which I mentioned is the last one. Okay, let's go to the next one here. 
So we're Socrates has a lot more to him, but we're going to learn a lot about Socrates through Plato now as we get into Plato because all of Plato's dialogues are about Socrates and people have a He's hard time. He's his master, of course, yes. Well, well, well hard, people have a hard time distinguishing between the two, too. Like where does Socrates end and Plato pick up and what when Plato describes Socrates and the dialogues, what aspects of that are Plato's philosophies? What aspects are Socrates? I mean, we have a general idea, um, but a lot of people argue about that stuff to this day. Exactly. Well, that's that's the question, too. If uh, Plato was documenting Socrates, I, I'm assuming Plato documented himself, too, and then you're documenting yourself. That's, I mean, not really. It could be skewed. He didn't, no? I mean, he not as himself. Again, he, he's speaking as Socrates through almost every single one of the dialogue. You'll see. But. All right. So Plato was born 424, roughly, to 328 B.C. He was a classical Greek philosopher from Athens. Uh, he studied, or he was the student of Socrates, Heraclitus, and Parmenides, which we discussed Heraclitus and Parmenides in the last episode. He founded the Platonist School of Thought and the Academy, uh, which was the first institution of higher learning in the Western world. So the Academy is where you wanted to go if you you know wanted to learn about philosophy and metaphysics, that kind of stuff. He was the teacher of Aristotle and was credited with being one of the founders of spirituality of the Western religion and chain of neoplatonic thinkers like i mentioned before thomas aquinas and all the early uh neo neoplatonists so like christianity isn't based off of you know their philosophy but it had an influence on it um right and he created the written forms of dialogues and dialects which we will get into in a little bit he is also credited with uh, Western uh, political philosophy. So politics were discussed, but he really, you know, the Republic and there's a, a ton of his dialogues that reference either uh, politics and justice and those kind of themes, order. Uh, he was the son of uh, Ariston and Periction, I, th I think is how you pronounce her name, his mother. He had a sister, Proton. And two brothers, Adamantus and Glaucon. Glaucon was Plato's older brother. Glaucon was the interlocutor in the allegory of the cave, which is uh, one of the main uh, one of the main parts of the Republic. It's an allegory in there. And yeah, that's a big one. Uh, yeah, we've discussed that on the show before too. It's what does interlocutor mean? As I mentioned in, in the terminology at the beginning, if you were oh, I got to study up. My bad. If you were paying attention to your own podcast, Maurice, <laughs> uh, I didn't write the definition down. It means somebody that just participates in the dialogue. So, okay. in this case, most of them are Socrates is the main person, but then the other person, which would be the interlocutor, gotcha. would be the other. Okay. Uh, ba 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 ba. <laughs> He came up uh, with the theory of forms in which he puts forth the idea that abstract object exists outside of the human mind. Uh, that's platonic realism or platonic idealism. And the world of concre concrete objects and the unch uh, and unchanged, unseen world of forms or abstract objects. So Plato, the, the theory of forms is that we have this world that we know is this reality that we live day to day. That's considered to him in the, the theory of forms is that it's a mimic or some like knockoff of some ultimate or unseen realm where the true forms of, of these things exist. So everything is kind of a copy off of this unseen realm, whatever you want to call it. You know, Almost some, like a simulation. Yeah, like a simulation or, uh, I mean, yeah, I guess modern day based on... I'm just saying it sounds a lot no, similar no, you're, to some of these theories now. You're right. It is kind of like a modern day simulation. And for a simulation to exist, something would have to exist for that to be simulated off of. So you're kind of right in that regard. Um, I like that. I, I like that idea. So, yes, yeah, th this stuff was talked about pretty much, obviously you know, 2000 years before computers or 2,500 years before computers, you know, these people were tossing around these ideas that 
we still toss it around to this day. And that's why we're yeah. doing this uh, series is because I think that if you go back and look at the history of, you know, consciousness and thought and mind and early philosophy, you kind of get a picture of how we got to where we are today and maybe even where we're going based on what we know that we've learned since these people. So, Yeah, it also is somewhat humbling to see that not much has changed since this. Yes, computers and different things have developed, but the, well, yeah, you I mean, get down to the core root of everything, it still boils down to that same that same idea. And again, I don't know if we'll ever know, but it's try and find out. Yeah, a lot of these guys are uh, they're wrong. <laughs> these philosophers, yeah. you know, like well, it's hard to be right about everything. Well, but some but of the s- stuff they theorize it, were is somewhat. So like there's obviously things that we still don't know that they were tossing around and then there's ideas that we know for sure that they were wrong about. It just depends (laughs) on, you know, what it is. But so Plato supposedly, according to some sources, also studied in Egypt, Italy, Sicily and Serene. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's where they believe that he studied, you know, uh, mathematics he came up with platonic love and platonic solids. So if you've ever heard of, you know, the concept of platonic love, which would be that there's no sexual sexual connotation to it, that's where that came from. And he discusses love in his dialogues uh, symposium. And I forget. What that's crazy. Name. I never realized that platonic is a direct derivative of his name. Yeah. Interesting. Most people don't really think about that no he believed in immortality of the soul uh in the timaeus he and socrates locate the parts of the soul all right let's go so now we get into the dialogues plato never speaks as himself in the dialogues he only speaks as socrates except for the laws Aristotle makes a distinction between Socrates' theory of forms and Plato's. He believed Socrates' idea of forms was much more tied to the investigation of the physical world or the natural world, while Plato's idea of forms, as we just mentioned, existed outside the scope of human understanding. Um, In the dialogue, Socrates appears to have a mystical side to him uh, when discussing the mystery of religions and reincarnation, uh, which would be like the Eleusinian mysteries and you know discussions on immortality, that kind of stuff. But people more associate these ideas with Plato. Uh, the the common theme throughout the dialogues is the trial of Socrates, which ended in his execution. The dialogue apology is Socrates's defense speech. Credo, as I mentioned before, kind of discusses uh, his friend Credo that comes to him you know, after his trial and tries to help him escape, you know, but he doesn't want to. Uh, The Phaedo takes place in prison after he's found guilty of impiety, corrupting the youth of Athens and being sophist. Um, So what was the deal? They just didn't like this guy? They just thought he was... So... What what was their reasoning to accuse? When Plato wrote this stuff, he was angry at Athens. He felt like Athens killed the only moral and just philosopher, and probably he considered a philosopher king, meaning that he felt like Socrates was really the only one worthy of being king out of anybody that he knew. Oh, Uh, yeah, he's smart. He actually has a brain. It's not just passed through lineage. Right, and that's why Socrates was so groundbreaking was because it wasn't the standard um, what was considered, you know, just normal philosophy. It was was adding these new different uh, dialects, uh, dialectics and dialogues and, and just the, the way he went about it, like I said, just questioning people and helping them arrive at answers that he, maybe he had already arrived at it in his own head by asking himself those questions or some semblance, uh, something along those lines. It's a form of art, essentially, because he's, he's conjuring up emotions and thoughts within you by just asking questions. Pretty interesting. Right. Uh, like I mentioned before, Credo offers to finance his escape, but so- this is what's where Socrates says, an injustice may not be answered with injustice. So he's saying that by, you know, of course him being in that position is an injustice and it's not true and it's wrong and all that stuff, but by him escaping is 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 also an injustice. So he's not going to, you know, 
answer the one with the other because it just would, you know, that's not who he was. Yeah. In the Phaedo, Socrates discusses the soul and immortality in the hours leading up to his execution where he was forced to drink hemlock. Hemlock was the poison. In the Apology, Socrates also says the unexa- the unexamined life is a life not worth living, which if you think about it, it's kind of true. I mean, I think yeah. that way at least. If you're not going to examine your own life, if you're not going to go on a quest quest for knowledge, I mean, there's a lot of people out there that go through their day-to-day consciousness and just don't even think about these themes or topics. And I guess that's fine, you know, but you're just a cog in the machine at that point, you know, or or they mask it and they don't want to touch. Well, yeah, that could be it too. It could be some sort of when people do those, you know, the day-to-day stuff and just the routine and just go through life like that. It could be some way of not dealing with certain things or masking it. But yeah, I think if, you know, if you're looking for truth, that's, that's what you do. Right. Plato's theory of forms is highlighted in the Republic. There is the allegory of the cave, the analogy of the sun, and the divided line. Uh, Plato describes the lost civilization of Atlantis in the Timaeus and the Critias. Uh, It was passed down, I said before, I think six generations. I think that's wrong. I did more research. I think it's actually three generations to Plato. Uh... Plato was said to be related to Solon on his mother's side or some sort of relation there. It's it's a little unsure. Solon is also <laughs> believed to have been told the story of Atlantis from Sankis, an Egyptian priest while in Sais, Egypt. Uh, people argue to this day whether Atlantis was a real civilization or just a, a you know, a, you know, basically a myth. Now, we've yeah. we've talked about this a lot. I think I don't know. I go back and forth on it. And and when I say that, I don't mean some advanced civilization where there's flying machines and stuff like that. I I just mean in terms of we know the Younger Dryas impact happened in the Younger Dryas era, roughly 9,600 or before that, um, uh, 9,600 years ago. That's when Gobekli Tepe was built. So we know that there was civilization and stuff happening way before we even thought that there was. So I do think it is a possibility that, some advanced civilization or regional civilization existed that was maybe seafaring or could get around much better than we thought, you know, and we're also even now coming up with, if you look at a lot of the archeological stuff or evolutionary stuff, they're always pushing timelines around. They say one thing when we were in high school, it was something completely different than it is now. And I think that that's just going to compete continue to change the more things we dig up the more evidence we find uh who's no, who knows what's going to be found at the bottom of the sea at some point by accident well they or... just found some like noah's ark type thing did you see that no yeah they used some uh like lidar uh, or something they used some some technology to scan they've been scanning the world and they found some like some remains of an ark we might have to do an episode on this thing it's pretty interesting <clears throat> well yeah they used lidar uh which is you know it, it scans from above. They yeah. Found, they found an ancient Mayan site with that as well. So, I mean, it, it definitely works. Um, Some of his dialogues that don't have a narrator are Credo, uh, Euthyphro, uh, Gor- or George- Gorgias, Mino, and the Phaedrus. Uh, the dialogues that are narrated by Socrates are Carmides, Republic, and Lysis. Uh, Plato used Socratic method in his early dialogues like Euphoro and Ion, and later dialogues like Theotetus and the Sophist. Plato has Socrates use the dialect, uh, dialectical method. The dialectical method is similar to a debate, except it excludes subjective elements, yeah, like... Um, appealing to somebody's emotions or something along those lines. All right, let's go to the next. Just wanted one. to say very good with those names. Yeah. I'm going to have to do a comedy skit it's where hard, I just man. read names. It's hard. Yeah, I I know it's hard. Well, cuz in the the other thing is is and anybody listening to this, I suggest there's some audible um I mean, I've read some of the these books and the Republic and different things, but there's some audible audio 
like lectures. They're called the uh-huh. great, great courses lectures. There's one on philosophy on the mind. There's one on play or the dialogues. There's one on Aristotle. I highly recommend them. And there's also when you listen to people talk about this stuff, people have different ways of pronouncing different things. So you never right. know what you know. I, there is a more you look at the 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 phonetic pronunciation from the greek uh oh there's an affect to it i'm sure you gotta... yeah but you it's it's one of those things where like i said i've heard people mention some of these things in different ways so yeah, right well you my... do your best and people will chastise us and uh, that'll be that <laughs> well we are not we are not scholars by any means i'm not worried about it i mean all this yep. stuff is Speak pretty for yourself man <laughs> oh okay all this stuff is pretty much basic information so um Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's not uh, like we're having a dialogue or debate about their debates, you know, so it's we're literally just putting the information out there and hopefully people this will gain, you know, spark them. Yeah. It'll spark them to look into some stuff. So very good, sir. So here's somewhat of a chronicle. There's no and I'll mention this again, even with the pre-Socratic stuff. Now we're to the Socratic era. There's a lot of timelines that shift. There's a lot of debate on what was early, what was late, what years things happened. So this is just the best idea of that. In the early period of Plato's life, you've got the Apology, Carmides, Credo, Euthyphro, Gorgias, Hippias Minor, Hippias Major, Ion, Latches, Lysis, and Protagoras. Um, and then the middle period, part of his life you've got Crit- uh, Cratylus, uh, Euthydemus, Mino, Parmenides, Phaedo, Phaedrus, Republic, Symposium, and Theotetus. Uh, the late period you've got the Crit- Critias, Sophist, Statesman, Timaeus, Philebus, and Laws. Now we're going to go through, and I'm kind of, we're not going to describe every single one. I think I leave a few of them out, like Hippias Minor, Hippias Major. Hippias Minor and Hippias Major is about a sophist named Hippias that Plato has a dialogue about, and um, they just kind of go back and forth about stuff. The Apology, which is one of Plato's most popular dialogues, describes Uh, Socrates defending himself against the charges of corrupting the youth of Athens and not believing in the gods. So as I mentioned before, you know, he was charged with impiety and, you know, they were worried about the rhetoric, you know, there would be these dialogues, public dialogues and stuff where the crowd would go wild for stupid stuff. And we'll get into that. I think there's one later on, I believe it's, which one is it? Um, I think it's the Euthydemus where there's two, yeah, there's two brothers. There's Euthydemus and his brother. And I'll wait because we'll get to that. But they used to have these dialogues and debates in, in open. Sometimes there'd be spectators, sometimes there wouldn't. And there's no real way. Obviously, this is written through Plato's point of view. So there's no real way to tell historically what actually occurred. You know, we know uh-huh. we know these people were real people based on, you know, historical records and stuff like that but there's two dudes screaming at each other no one's even around (laughs) credo takes place in prison after socrates is convicted of impiety and corrupting the youth of athens socrates friend credo again offers to help him escape through execution and again i mentioned this before but socrates thinks injustice may not be answered with injustice uh the youth essentially these are just stories and we don't know if they're true or not well, they're dialogue. So it's philosophy that's written in a way where that's entertaining pl- somewhat. Pla- or... pla- yeah, Plato's using the voice of Socrates because that was his teacher, and this is probably how Socrates thought. But they, these things didn't actually occur, most likely, gotcha. the, the way that they were written. Maybe All they right, did. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you know, Socrates taught Plato and told him some of these stories, and maybe he took p- bits and pieces and whatever. But for the most part, again, this is just stuff written by Plato in Socrates' voice. Gotcha. The uh, the Euthyphro is a dialogue between Socrates and Euthyphro that covers the meaning of justice, piety, uh, in the weeks leading up to the trial of Socrates. Uh, The Gorgias is a dialogue between Socrates and a bunch of sophists at a dinner party. 
Socrates debates Gorgias about the true definition of rhetoric. Uh, rhetoric was used back then in different ways. We'll talk about it in a second in the Euthydemus, but uh, there would be there's a, a version of it called heuristic where somebody's just trying to argue with you and make their point to come out on top without actually trying to get at truth. So there's really no logic to it in, in, in a sense. You know, there's sure. it's just this way to win the argument, but you're not actually winning the argument. You're it, you kind of look like an idiot. <laughs> um, and let's see here. OK, so we'll go Prot- Protagoras. Uh, he was a famous sophist and we'll do when we do our part on the sophist. We'll talk about him a lot. Uh, but it's also the name of a dialogue where 21 people are present, including three sophists, Socrates and an old Protagoras argue over whether virtue can be taught. And Socrates, not spoiler, but Socrates wins, Whoa, the, ar- wins the argument by pointing out uh, that if you know all virtue is knowledge, then it can be taught. So if you believe virtue is knowledge or part of it, then it can be taught, which they would go back and forth and um, debate about. Uh, Cratylus, in the in the dialogues, Socrates is asked by Cratylus and Hermogenes whether the names are natural or conventional, and whether language has like an intrinsic relation to things uh, that they represent, or is it just some arbitrary system of signs? So. I'm sure lots of people have ever thought about this. Like, what is language? What is meaning of, of language? You know, we assign these, you know, like mm-hmm. your name's Maurice. Well, what does that mean? It's just a sound that's coming the out of The language of love, my friend. Right. Have you ever this, heard Steve Miller? But it's the sound that comes out of my mouth. Right, that, yeah. That, it's that it's is just a, like it might as well be a bark at that, this point. Well, that is assigned to you, and then it's built into the consciousness and your, your system of thinking, and gets recorded there and then now we start recording things you're maurice i'm mike and then we start building off of that until you have this this purpose this in, network in, of, of yeah. yeah in a way we, we assign purpose or names and meaning to things so it's very heady stuff yes okay as i mentioned above there's the youth of demas socrates this is actually an interesting one i've read this one a few times Socrates engages in a dialogue with two sophists who are brothers, Euthydemus and Dionysodorus. Uh, Plato writes the dialogue as a a satire on logical fallacy, uh, basically the logical fallacies of the sophists. The brothers try to demonstrate philosophical superiority over Socrates using what I mentioned before, the heuristic arguments, which are used to successfully debate or dispute another person's argument and disregard the search for truth, basically. The so that's bro- why everybody thinks Socrates didn't like the Sophists because he, he just bashes them in almost all his stories. Well, he, he would engage in dialogues with Sophists. With, right. And, and again... He'd be against it. Well, he, yeah, he was, he was against it, but at the same time, he would try and teach these people too. So like in, when you, when in the dialogues, when he's talking to a sophist, he's not just trying to win the argument or win the dialogue. He's trying uh-huh. to use his Socratic method or Socratic irony or whatever method he's using to question them, to get them to think on the lines of what he thinks is truth or what he thinks is right, which, you know, it depends on That's how sweet. you're looking at it, but. Yeah, and then the brothers are portrayed as not being very smart. Euthydemus is a little bit more intelligent than his brother. Um, Let's go to the next one. Old (laughs) Dino. Okay, in Mino, Mino is a dialogue where Mino and Socrates discuss the definition of virtue. Mino wants Socrates just to give him all the answers. He doesn't want to do any work. He doesn't want to question things. He doesn't want to go back and forth he just wants Socrates to tell him this is when Socrates starts to employ the Socratic method and trick Mino into thinking for himself perfect (laughs) so there's a common theme here which is you know Socrates asking questions pertinent questions philosophical questions and having these people respond and if they come to the truth or they come to an answer great if not it was worth a shot pretty much 
in Parmenides, Parmenides is a dialogue where a young Socrates meets Parmenides and Zeno of Elia, both which we mentioned in the previous episode of this series. Parmenides and Zeno, uh, Parmenides was Zeno's teacher. Zeno defends Parmenides uh, in, in a number of pieces and through the paradoxes, Zeno's paradoxes. The reason for the meeting was Zeno was reading his treatise on defending par, uh, Parme, uh Parmidian monism and monism, I'm sorry. Monism, which we discussed on the last episode, was, for anybody that doesn't know what monism is, is it's the single explanation for everything. So you had Thales that thought water was the basis of everything. Um, you know, it goes, each person, each pre Socratic, no, that was not one of them. The pre Socratics oh. <laughs> had different ones for each. Each of them kind of had their own thing. Um, you know, there's the a- air peron, or a peron, fire, um, air. They each kind of had their own take on what was the single thing that everything's made up of. So, Right, and they had a little bit of truth in all of them because you need all those. Well, right, good, so. some, some of them, yeah. But again, that we know water isn't the basis of everything you know but it, it could look you could see how that could look that way back then if you didn't have any scientific basis you know there was there was no science so right and i i always thought that that humans have this connection to water like well, even when i'm around it i whenever i go in the woods i'm always oh, searching we, for water we for do some i think aren't our bodies made up of like 60 or 70 percent water right yeah that, and we need it i'm just saying in your well, mentally like and connected. to him you know you need it to live living things yeah. need, need it to live so you could see how that would be the case yes uh bu- 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 bu. so yeah and parmenides was a huge influence on both socrates and plato let's see the phaedo is a dialogue where socrates discusses immortality the soul and the afterlife this takes place in the hours leading up to his execution it's probably one of the more read of of his dialogues um because that whole trial and the dialogues leading up to his death i mean that's some good stuff intriguing yeah and there's a lot of truth in there and um the Republic, which is so, this is the big boy. This is the one Plato's most known for, and kind of takes on a whole bunch of different topics. There's a bunch of different books. Uh, he has his take on justice, order, and character. Uh, the idea of hypothetical. There's a hypothetical. Uh, I don't know why I put hypothetically in there, but there's a hypothetical city of uh, Cali uh, Palace where. Uh, they discuss the philosopher king. And as I mentioned before, Socrates was considered by Plato to be maybe the only one worthy of this because he knew what he didn't know and he wasn't trying to project anything and he wasn't power hungry, he wasn't money hungry. So that's the kind of person that they're hypothetically discussing as being somebody that could rule as opposed to some sort of... um, democracy where everybody has a say and fights about stuff and things get out of hand and you know if you even look at like again athens how they were overtaken by um sparta and the reason why the athenians lost was because there was a lot of infighting a lot of disarray and sparta, didn't unite sparta took advantage of that exactly uh the, they also discussed the immortality of the soul and the theory of forms we discussed the theory of forms uh, the dialogue also contains the allegory of the cave. Okay, so let's talk about the allegory of the cave, even though we've mentioned it before. Where Socrates, this is where Socrates has Plato's brother Glaucon. Imagine a cave where prisoners are chained up. Okay, the prisoners are chained up facing a cave wall, and there's a fire to their back. There's a fire behind them. The only thing that they can see is their own shadows projected on the cave wall. Now, then Plato starts to, well, he writes it as Socrates, but then they start to question, okay, so let's say one day one of these prisoners gets out of the chains and all they've ever known their whole life is just this image of their shadow on the wall. 
that person, when they get out, they wouldn't run out into the light because they would be blinded. So what they would do is still hide in the darkness, most likely, even though they would have more of a view on what's going on, it would still be hard for them to see since they're not used to the light. And then he starts to ponder, well, then maybe somebody drags this person out of the cave into the light, into the world, and then that person would be exposed to what real life is or what reality is. And then Mm -hmm. that person comes back into the cave, tries to describe this amazing, wonderful thing that he just saw and to the other people that are still chained up and they wouldn't believe him or they think he's crazy. They would think it would be terrible to get out based on the things that he's saying. So it's this, it's this exercise in, um, you know, phys like metaphysical thinking in terms of, a paradigm shift. So if one day, let's say we all woke up in the sky was orange and it stayed orange. Eh, I guess that's not a good, cause it could be orange based on sunlight. It's, it's normally blue, but you know, if the sun's blurring, so let's just say that you walk outside and it's, it's night constantly. You would have no idea what was going on. Why is it, you know, people in Alaska, I'm sure are used to it in other parts of the world, but if it was night constantly here or where you are in Michigan, after a couple of days, you'd start thinking, well, what's going on? And mm-hmm. then, you know, there's this paradigm shift that happens where you start to realize everything you know might be wrong. And that's kind of what happens in this allegory is that everything these people knew to be true or re- based on reality is wrong. And that's how plato believed that with the theory of forms and stuff that we're just our senses are lying to us so we're just going through this world and we're basing everything off sight touch sound you know all the all the different perceptions and senses and the theory of forms suggests that there's some alternate reality where the the true the true form of these things exists and we're just this copy or again like you mentioned it could be some simulation type aspect so that yeah, sounds of, like a DMT experience that's kind of what exactly I would assume anybody that has done psychedelic smoke DMT whatever has had this paradigm shift and we'll we're gonna do a whole episode on this but all three of these guys most likely participated in the Lucinian mysteries it's mentioned by Plato it's mentioned by Socrates and it's mentioned by Aristotle and the Lucinian mysteries and the cult of uh, Demeter and all that stuff they believe they drank the stuff called uh, Kikion and Kikion was this they believe had ergot which are uh, claviceps perpea which is a precursor to LSD and that's a huge paradigm shift. So when these people had these would go to the Eleusinian mysteries and have this um, ritual where it was based on dying and rebirth and those kinds of themes that you could see how that would have a massive impact. And not to mention a lot of these people based stuff on geometry. Not only was it the basis of, of math and stuff back then, but also when anybody that's ever had a psychedelic experience, what do you see? You see a lot of geometric patterns. I mean, I have a million times in psychedelic states. So it's it's one of those things where I could see maybe that would be maybe be the inspiration or at least maybe somebody early on that was playing with this stuff realized, oh, there's... I don't know There's how to, more out there. Well, I don't know how to frame this. I just think that, like, if play, play, I could see where Plato came up with this theory of forms based on reading, like, the Eleusinian Mysteries and all everything about Plato. Because, as I just mentioned, by doing psychedelics, let's say they did drink this this concoction and it did have uh, uh, the precursors to LSD, LSA, or um, you know, like I said, the the ergot you could go into a state where you felt like that was maybe the real reality is, is where you are in the psychedelic world. If you are seeing geometric patterns, you could see where that maybe is the building blocks for this world that we live in as reality. So when I read this stuff and people like, Oh, the theory of forms and Oh, it's this made up thing. Or some people equate it to some sort of spiritual religious aspect of things. I relate it to these people were doing psychedelics psychedelics have been done forever since people started eating 
you know, mushrooms and stuff off the ground and plants and different things. Mm -hmm. So I see no reason why that couldn't be, couldn't have been the inspiration for some of these things. I'm not saying they didn't come up with it on their own either. I'm just saying it would make sense that something along those lines would have a profound impact on one of these guys for sure as it has other great thinkers so that we do know yeah yeah so that's the republic it's you know one of i would say it's plato's most famous pieces obviously but it's all or dialogues it's also his crown jewel and is considered one of the greatest most influential pieces of writing of all time um People still refer to it this day. It's still talked about to this day, as a lot of these other ones are, but that one specifically with the politics and the order and the justice and all that kind of stuff. So, Theotetus is Socrates and Theotetus discuss the definition of knowledge. Socrates says Theotetus benefited from knowing what he did not know and that he should revisit the topic in the future. So, in that dialogue, Socrates is asking Theotetus questions and they're going back and forth about knowledge. And the end result is that he feels like Theotetus isn't maybe mentally ripe enough to get to the, to some sort of conclusion. So he tells mm-hmm. him to come back to it later on. So the Critias describes how, gr- how the great lost civilization of Atlantis uh, tried to conquer Athens, but failed due to the order, the ordered society of the Athenians. So here you have an example, as I mentioned, how Sparta conquered the Athenians. Well, it was first the Athenians who staved off being conquered from the Atlanteans. And that's described in the Critias, uh, among with other things. And I'm just giving you a brief summary of what I think the main theme of these dialogues are. There's other right. themes in them. You know, some of these things have multiple things going on. But this is oh, just yeah. a, this is just a basic, you know synopsis of it so because we could sit here and all all day and talk about it which i don't want to do but uh i think people should if you're i'm hoping to give you a little a little taste and then if uh-huh. you, you you like something you see go check it out go read it go get into it and if you know what you're talking about and you think we're idiots that's fine too <laughs> well that's what it's all about is people going out on their own and finding meaning for themselves right in sophist, uh, you tried to Socrates tried to identify what a sophist is and how it differs from a statesman and a philosopher. That might be a good one for you, Maurice, because you were you were asking about the sophist. The so. death of a salesman. Uh, that's a statesman, not a salesman. <laughs> I know. And uh, in the Timaeus, it is a dialogue between Socrates, Timaeus, Critias, and Herm. Uh, um, Hermocrates, they discuss the nature of human beings, the physical world. Uh, Critias tells the story of Solon's journey to Egypt, where he's told the story of Atlantis. Uh, So again, if you like Atlantis uh, mythology and possibly are researching it to see if it was a real place, you would probably look in the Timaeus and the Critias. It is Critias, not Critias? Yeah, it's Critias. Uh, Philobus, uh, let's see here. Socrates discusses pleasure, ethics, uh, dialectics, and uh, ontology with other interlocutors. Is that where filibuster came from, or I don't know. It's a good question. Maybe I could see that. Well, when you filibuster, you're just trying to take up time, right? So people get so irritated they just give up, right? That could Mm. be. That could be. I never even made that connection, but that could be it. You may have been on to something, Maurice. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> and here we have Aristotle. So where we have Socrates who's concerned with moral order and ethics, justice, and you know, he dabbles in the metaphysics, but it's not his main concern. And then you have Plato whose theory of forms is the basis of a lot of metaphysical theology and stuff like that. Uh, He would be considered more of the mystic out of the three. Then you get to Aristotle, who would be more of like a modern day physicist, who is a, he isn't a complete uh, material reductionist, but 
that's pretty much the basis of where we get that kind of thinking. Uh, so with Aristotle, 384 to 322 BC, he was born in Stagira in northern Greece. He was a classical Greek philosopher and polymath in ancient Greece. For anybody who doesn't know what a polymath is, a polymath was somebody who excelled in multiple disciplines. You guess you could equate it to like a Renaissance man. He founded the Lyceum and uh, Peripatetic School of Philosophy. Uh, Aristotelianism is a school of thought or tradition inspired by the work of Aristotle. The school of thought is influenced by early or it influenced early Christian and then Islamic philosophers. Aristotle was considered one of the founders of Western philosophy. Aristotle's writing covered many topics such as metaphysics, physics, biology, psychology, zoology, logic, politics, economics, rhetoric, linguistics, ethics, aesthetics, theater, poetry, and music. This guy really had his hand. Yeah, yeah, this guy's a jack of all trade. He had his hand in everything. Yeah. Uh, between the age of 17 to 18, Aristotle joined Plato's Academy in Athens. He studied there as a student until around the age of 37. After Plato died, Aristotle left Athens and took King Philip II of Mastodon uh, on his offer to teach his son Alexander the Great, starting around 343 B.C. So Aristotle was Alexander the Great's teacher. He also taught King Philip II's other son, King, uh, Philip III, and Ptolemy, who Ptolemy ended up being, he conquered Egypt, which is pretty crazy, too. Yeah, I bet you he was getting paid for that, too. Yeah, I mean, you could say... Sophos. <laughs> Sophos. Um, Aristotle's, again, that's not just what that means, but yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, all right, whatever, man. Aristotle's physical science had a huge influence on modern science and academics, um, and ba it, people took his work pretty seriously until the Enlightenment in the 18th century. All right. He was the first one to study formal logic, and this was the dominant form of logic in Western philosophy until mathematical logic made advancements sometime in the 19th century. He applied deductive reasoning to arrive at a conclusion based on two or more propositions that assume that are assumed to be true. Um, I think in uh, Kant's uh, a critique on reason, he said something like logic was completed by Aristotle or it was finished by with Aristotle, something along those lines. Uh, Aristotle wrote dialogues that were preserved in the form of treatises. Treatises, uh, a treatise is like a longer version of an essay, basically. Uh, his most notable works uh, were On the Soul, Poetics, Politics, Physics, Metaphysics, and Nisomian, or Machian Ethics. I don't even know how to pronounce that one. That, yeah. one. that one escaped me. So he was a get-down-to-business type of guy. There was no fluff around his points. Yeah, a lot of his stuff was observational when it came to science, and we'll get into that in a minute. And he was very astute in, in, in the, the category of logic and reason and those kinds of things. Uh, in his work, Metaphysics, he discusses substance and essence. His, his uh, philosophical theory, uh, hylomorphism, states that things are comprised of both matter and form. His teacher Plato believed that there was a separate world of forms, which we discussed, that actual things imitate in this reality. Aristotle deviated from that thought and believed that things were an overlapping, for, were an overlapping of form and matter. So if you were to put it, let's say, in a, in a Venn diagram for Aristotle, so you have one side on the right, one side on the left, one, one, one of them's uh, form and one of them's matter, and he thinks that, his theory was that it was somewhere in the middle between those two things. 
Whereas Plato believed if there's like one bubble, there's another completely bubble that's completely separate from that other bubble up up in the air somewhere or so wherever you want to say outside of that other bubble. Uh, when it comes to epistemology, Aristotle's imminent realism means that his knowledge is based on the study of things and observations of the natural world, uh, which r rises to the universal. So he believes his school of thought was looking at things from the finite or into the infinite. So um, he would make observations in the natural world and then theorize the bigger picture from there as opposed to Plato's epistemology, uh, epistemolo epistemolo I can't say, epistemological, <laughs> yeah, epistemological um, views came from the opposite way, meaning that Plato looked at things from the infinite or the metaphysical to the finite. Uh, and again, that was from his theory of forms. And... Uh, Let's see here. Even though Aristotle was Plato's student, as you can see, their epistemological, epi oh my fucking, epistemological, epistemological. No, I just, I don't know why I'm having a tough time saying, I say that word all the time, and for some reason I can't say it right now. Epistemological, okay? There you go. Yeah, folks. it's tough. I, some of that, sometimes I get tongue tied. And we don't edit. This is live. So you can, Baby. All, you can all just screw off if you have a problem with it. <laughs> Twitter's uh, going ballistic right now. <laughs> uh, so, oh yeah, okay. So Aristotle was Plato's student, and as you can see, their epistemological views come from the opposite end of the spectrum. Nailed it. <laughs> Out of all the ancient Greek philosophers, Aristotle had the largest influence on what we call modern science. Uh, his natural philosophy examined the phenomenon of the natural world. Today we would trans... You know, today... He, it would translate into what modern biology, physics, and the natural sciences are. So, again, he had a huge influence on stuff that we use to this day. Uh, Aristotle built on Empedocles' theory of the four elements. So back then, the pre-Socratic philosopher Empedocles, which we didn't talk about in the pre-Socratics. I should have added him in there, but I didn't. I forgot. He had the theory of the four elements. Uh, and his theory was the four elements were earth, water, air, and fire. Uh, Aristotle added ether as the fifth element to that little uh, chart, and he believed that ether was the divine substance of the heaven heavenly spheres, planets, and stars. Um, so he's referring see. to, like, in the ether, not the ether, the chemical. Yeah, yeah, no, not that. Like when you hear someone say it's in the ether. Yeah, you hear, and... like philosopher like Rudolf Steiner talking about the ether. Exactly. He's that's not, what he's, I was thinking. He, yeah, of. he's not talking about, you know It's almost sounds fear like and it's loathing almost dark matter. Right, right. Huffing ether or something like but that. But I think of the ether it's like almost dark matter, wouldn't you say? Yeah, it could be what I think of when they talk about it is like the space in between everything. Like yeah. What is that made of? Like that's when people talk about that. That's what I think of is the the space in between all the, the matter that's out there in the universe. Um, which, yeah, you could be right. Dark matter is kind of one of those things. It's like a subgroup of that. Uh, Aristotle believed, or, oh yeah, Aristotle believed yeah, yeah. there was four causes of how things came to be. The first was material cause, which describes the material that things are composed of, which is kind of, you know, makes sense. Yeah. Number two is formal cause, the essence or argument of that matter or arrangement, I'm sorry, the essence or arrangement of that matter. So that would probably be like the composition or the molecular composition kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the efficient cause, which would be the primary source, that this is related to modern, the modern definition of cause. So efficient cause was what we know today as cause for in, in scientific terms. And final cause, or telos. As we mentioned, telos means purpose, end, or goal. And this, ref the final cause referred to the purpose of a thing or why something is done. So I hope that makes sense. Yes, very good. 
And I've learned a lot too from doing all this research. I mean, I already knew a little bit about all these guys, but check you, it, double check it. Yeah. Well, when you go back and you go over it and you, I read some of the dialogues again and I listened to some of the audible stuff and I looked up stuff and cross reference stuff online you know, you learn a few things here and there every single time, even though a lot of these things are reoccurring themes and, you know, just repeated stuff. There is some little nuggets in there as well. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Aristotle used biology to drive his points home, whereas Socrates and Plato would use math. So as I mentioned before, uh, Pythagoras had a huge influence on Socrates and Plato. Now, when Plato and Socrates, as I mentioned before, would have a dialogue or debate, and most of what we know is from the dialogues uh, that Plato wrote, they would refer to mathematics or use mathematics to drive their point home or make their point. Aristotle, since he was so into biology, would use biology to drive his point home, which in modern context would be, I mean, they're both pretty good. I still think mathematics is a little bit more empirical, but biology could work too. Uh huh. He was the first to study biology systematically, and it was a large part of his work and observations. He spent a few years on the island of Lesbos studying and describing its zoology, on top of his own observations, he would interview fishermen and anyone who specialized in uh, the knowledge of animals and sea life. I think he also talked to, um, you know, beekeepers and just people that were around insects and, you know, wildlife, that kind of stuff. He recorded all of his data in his works, Movement of Animals, which would describe the locomotion of animals. Uh, generation of Animals, uh, which details how animals reproduce parts of animals, which describes the anatomy and the physiology of animals and the history of animals, which is self-explanatory. Uh, his scientific style included observations, dissection and gathering data systematically looking for patterns in whole groups of animals and possible causal explanations he made the connection between an animal's structure and function, which if that sounds familiar, that's pretty much what the theory of evolution is. So you could say he came up with a precursor to Darwin's theory of evolution. Uh, again, this could be seen, you know. So he would equate, so let's say there's uh, a duck, okay? And he looked and he notices a duck has webbed feet. Okay, well that duck evolved the web feet to swim through the water. So that was kind of like his causal thinking when it came to these animals and correlating body parts to function to its surroundings or natural habitat. Yeah. Uh, the difference between Aristotle, what he believed and Darwin's theory is Aristotle believed the hybrid, the hybridization and mutations were actual rare accidents. So he didn't believe in natural selection in terms of, you know, survival of the fittest necessarily. He believed more that when things, you know, evolved or deviated or he thought it was some sort of like accident or rare event that happened. So that's kind of interesting. Mm. Uh, in his classification of living things, Aristotle observed roughly 500 different species of animals. In the history of animals, he graded them on a scale of perfection with man being at the top. His scale had 11 grades of animal, uh, had 11 grades of animals from the highest to lowest. The highest were animals that gave a warm live birth, uh, and the lowest animals were ones that laid cold eggs. He believed that the telos or purpose guided these natural processes. He is said to have also studied and classified plants as well. Uh, however, everything I've looked through, there's no recorded works on plants or anything that's survived at least. Um, his, so he, he starts to dabble into psychology too. Uh, in his psychology, um, in his treatise on the soul, Aristotle proposes a model consisting, consisting of three parts. So you have the vegetative soul, uh, which was connected to plants and consisted of reproduction and growth. 
Then you had the sensitive soul, which was connected to animals mm. and consisted of mobility and sensation. And then finally you get to the rational soul, which con was connected to humans and consisted of thought and reflection. Now the, the rational soul contained all three. So the rational soul had the, the vegetative soul parts and the sensitive soul parts. And then the sensitive soul part had, had the vegetative soul parts within it too. And then the veget uh, vegetative soul part had it, it was it's self-containing. So if you look at it, that's how we look at things today in terms of kind of consciousness, right? So you have yeah. plants or some people will argue that plants are conscious or have some sort of, you know, sentience. I don't subscribe to that, but I can be, you know, my mind can be changed based on uh, new evidence. I think uh -huh. that there is something to it, like in terms of, it might have its own thing that we just don't know about yet, but in terms of what we know is consciousness, I don't believe that plants are conscious. And then you have the um, sensitive soul, which are animals, which if you think about it, it makes sense that, you know, the mobility and sensation. So their consciousness is strictly, um, you know, it's, it's limited. It's, it's not, there's no self for not that we know for sure that well they're not creating art. Let's well, just say well that. yeah, exactly. But we're not. We don't know that dogs can't ponder life, but we do right. know. But we do know that they can interact with us. They know that that we can. They can show affection and emotion, and uh, you know we know those things. So if you look at this model, it's actually not for for the time. It's not a bad model on different levels of consciousness and attributes and stuff like that. Not at all. Uh, Aristotle believed that memory was the ability to hold on and hold on to and recall a perceived experience and like a mental picture kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. He also believed that sleep takes place from the overuses of senses. And his theory on dreaming was that it was an impression left on the mind from stimuli experienced during day to day consciousness that would come on during sleep. So he believed that sleep was caused by our overuse of senses. And then once we were in sleep, his theory was that dreaming is, so, you know, let's say you stare at your computer screen for a couple hours and then you close your eyes. What do you see? Right. An outline of your computer screen. So his theory is that that's what dreaming is, is that, is that, but within your, your, your sleep state. Uh-huh. Which, again, that would be what most people, modern day reductionist scientists, are thinking or trying to prove. Who knows if that'll ever come to fruition? I think we're. That, I mean, that, that may be the case, but there's, there's also other things that you can do, tap into or whatever within the dream, too. I don't know. Right. So, Good I think. stuff, th man. Yeah, I think that, again, for. That's why I was saying like Aristotle, I mean, he, he had probably had the most influence on modern day stuff out of all three of these guys. Not that Socrates wasn't important, not that Plato was important, but just in a day to day usefulness, modern day science aspect of things. Aristotle was the uh, the big boy between the three. Yeah, it seemed like Aristotle was presenting more hard, cold, hard facts as the other two guys are more of. But making you think more about yourself. I, I like the other two <laughs> approach better. It's more of the artistic approach. They're conjuring up thoughts within you and bringing out the answer within you, which I think that all happiness is within you. You just got to figure out how to tap into it. I think it's, you know, it's naive to look at these things and suggest that these people didn't know what they were talking about for sure, but that they were also so smart that they already knew everything. So it's like how it is today. I don't think modern science can explain everything as much as they wanted to try to. I don't know if that they ever will be able to explain everything. And based on Thomas Kuhn's uh, evolution of, you know, philosophy and uh, paradigm shifts and all that kind of stuff, there's going to be a point soon, hopefully soon, where there's enough evidence bottled up that creates some sort of scientific revolution and paradigm shift 
where we're forced to confront ideas that we consider to be truth that may not be 100% true. You know, if you look at gravity, there's no, between Newton's idea of gravity and Einstein's idea of gravity, and now we're discovering gravitational waves from the cosmic, you know, microwave background, it's all completely open to the possibility that we could be looking at something completely different, you know, or a different model sometime in the future. So for sure, but that's, that's where we leave off. And again, I I think a lot of these, the metaphysical stuff comes from possibly psychedelic use back then. I'm not, you know, we're going to talk about the Eleusinian mysteries in one of these episodes. I think we're going to do part three is going to be on the sophists. So we'll address the sophists. My they, man. The famous sophists, what they were, that kind of stuff. Uh, part four, I'm thinking maybe some of the megalithic structures in Greece. And then part five, we'll maybe dive into the Eleusinian mysteries. So Very good. Very good, sir. That's all I've got, though, for today. Is there anything you wanted to add or ask or... No, that was a good uh, presentation. I appreciate it. I learned for, a lot, Professor. For all you listening out there, I try to say, you know, as, le- as least as possible. I'm working on that. It's it's my go-to where some people might say like or uh or duh or whatever. Right. For some reason, that's what I say, and I'm trying not to say it. It's hard. It's hard, folks. When your brain tries to catch up, you go to words like that. Well, it's me thinking is what it hard is. Hard to get out of that. Yeah, when, of, you're, yeah. when you're live – that's just you fall back on whatever you're used to. And for but I don't say it in reality, like in real world, so I don't know why I say it on here, but it is what I say on here. So we'll have to have a T-shirt made that says, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Or I hate Maurice. We'll figure it out. No. I love Maurice. <laughs> Not you, man, the fans. Yeah. There's a couple out there that hate you for sure. <laughs> I've, I've seen some comments. Uh, that no, but thanks for checking us out. Um, you can check us out at uh, let's pull it up here. Patreon. Yeah, maybe we can leave some uh, some tidbits or links for some stuff in the Patreon to give some people some more background info. So what we'll do is, well, I'll put some I'll put some links and suggestions underneath the video here on YouTube. But check us out at patreon.com slash Mike and Maurice. Uh, for $2 a month, you'll get exclusive access to some videos and some audio. Uh, check us out at our website, Mike and Maurice Mind Escape.com. We have some suggestions, references, and lots of other stuff on there. Follow us on Instagram. We have a Twitter page. And as you can see, we have a Facebook group as well. So check us out on all those. Uh, we're pretty active on there, or at least try to be. If you have any questions or want to send us a message and have any topic suggestions or guest suggestions, pass them along. We're all ears, yes. We'll, we'll do our best to get to it, and uh, we appreciate. Again, I want to give a shout-out to our three new Patreon members. we got Mick or Mike Z, we got Tim Kirsch, and we've got Minty Farewell. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Uh, we don't make money. We actually pay money to do this show. Um, and it's just nice to see that people are appreciating it. So we appreciate you guys. Thank you. And with that, we are out. So peace. Have a good weekend.